Hello, and welcome to the 19th annual Green Living Festival, coming to you through the magic of electrons, like so many other things on the planet Earth these days. Coming to you from the Earthways Center at Missouri Botanical Garden. I'm Jean Ponzi from the Earthways team. We want to especially thank our presenting sponsor, Ameren, Missouri, for energizing so many efforts, so many options to live a little greener coming to you this week through some live events and many recorded events that you can view at your leisure at mobot.org slash green living fest. Today is June 11th, it's Naturescaping Day. And this live panel illustrates a concept that comes from nationally known native plant advocate, Doug Talamy with whom, by the way, we have a special interview talking about how good we're doing with this stuff in St. Louis. Homegrown National Park. It's a concept that lets each one of us in our neighborhoods, in our city, on our city streets, in our workplaces, where we play and learn and pray, restore habitat, restore biodiversity, and make the whole place livelier for our kin in the circle of life, as well as for ourselves. We have an expert panel today that will be talking about um, these efforts. I'm very excited to present them to you. Want to acknowledge Spire, our Green Living Festival workshop sponsor, bringing these live events and pre-recorded workshops to you. Here are our panelists for today. Michael Wolfstetter will be representing the South Hampton Neighborhood Association in the city of St. Louis. He is a Missouri Master Naturalist. Rachel Witt and Angie Weber will be representing the South Grand Community Improvement District. Uh, Rachel is the executive director of that organization and Angie Weber brings her extensive resource experience to the project as eco crew coordinator. And then from the city of Webster Groves Parks Department, Yvonne Steingruby, who is superintendent of parks for Webster. This is also a special presentation for the St. Louis Green Business Challenge. We have a weekly lunch and, see, lunch and learn series called Virtual Brown Bag. And today we also have representatives from companies in the Green Business Challenge joining us. And therefore we acknowledge Challenge presenting sponsor, Graybar. So without further ado, can we see our panelists here? Can I give a welcome to everyone? Just give us a wave. And Michael Walshtetter, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and we'll get our panel presentation up and start talking about Homegrown National Park in just a second. Again, native gardens on, on these little public spaces in our neighborhood. So uh, I, of course, uh, jumped on the idea and uh, I just want to mention a couple other names. Uh, Donna Berenger, who was our alderwoman at the time, um, she was a, a very proactive uh, partner in this relationship. She would always actually come to us asking us what resources we need. So uh, that, that was huge and really contributed to the success of this. And uh, this, all the projects are done on City of St. Louis Parks property. So Dan Spielman, who was commissioner at the time, uh, Kim Hegley, who is currently the commissioner, they've both been great people to work with. So I just want a couple of shout outs to them. So the background, the canvas we're working with are these small little wedges. They're about the size of a city parcel. Um, they're owned by City of St. Louis Parks, but uh, they're really too small to do anything much beyond just have them as, as turf grass wedges, as we call them. Gina, if you want to show the next slide. This is Marie's Wedge, and you can see we do have a Southampton sign in it, but it's just all grass. So Ron looked at this and said, why don't we put a garden on here? So let's go ahead and hit the next slide. We uh, put together a, a plan to convert various sections of this uh, wedge into native gardens. We uh, reached out to Brightside St. Louis. We got a grant through their neighbor's naturescaping grant. And then we assembled a, a team of neighborhood volunteers that also included a variety of master nationalists. And we began our work. Now we did all this work, hand tools and volunteers, sweat and toil and, and grants. And uh, this is progress through the, the development of these gardens. And um, let's go ahead and hit the next slide. This is what it looked like the following year um, and years subsequent. So we have a, a glade garden in the upper left corner. Those are all Missouri primrose. 
where the Southampton sign is. That's where our rain garden is located. This is a wedge that gets a lot of activity, especially this most recent spring with uh, people being home because of COVID. There's been a lot of families and other folks just hanging out in the wedge, picnicking in the wedge. In this picture, there's a father and his daughter checking on some of the flowers. Uh, the pollinators and other wildlife is the wedge. We've got the, the ruby-throated uh, hummingbird there. And then of course, just blooms alive. I mean, the, the wedge has really exploded with blooms this year. Let's go ahead and see the next slide. So a couple of years ago, um, new Neighborhood Association president, uh, Don Aga, and someone with uh, more of a corporate background recognized that we needed something more formal for the evolution of this wedge. Previously, I would put a design together, it would go through the approval process, but really from year to year, we were just kind of evolving in really kind of an organic way, which I suppose isn't a bad thing, but she recognized that to formalize this is probably going to be better for maintaining the sustainability of this wedge. All of the key players who are currently involved with wedge aren't always gonna be around. We wanted something that was gonna be more permanent and remain an asset for the neighborhood. So we gathered a team of individuals, uh, Scott Rundy from SWT Design, who is a, a neighbor and lives on the same block I do. Jackie Lumsden, Jackie Knight now with uh, CBB Transportation, she evaluated the design to make sure we didn't introduce any kind of line of sight issues. Wherry is a very busy street, and uh, we had some construction and traffic planning done just prior to, just about two years ago, and line of sight was one of the issues that was raised. We wanted someone involved that actually was a professional to doing that. Jackie's another Southampton resident. Uh, Cody Hale, Pretty City Gardens and Landscapes, has been a tremendous asset through the full life of these wedges, um, and uh, he's always involved heavily. He was also involved with this uh, new design. So we came up with this long range plan, and that's the plan at the top that you see there. And um, Scott designed it, it's a professional for six year plan. We're two years in at this point. And uh, it's, it's really just an amazing design that Scott came up with. We've got a couple of council circles that are hope to give more seating space, more space for people to just congregate and, and activate the wedge. The bottom left is the, the new rain garden. Cody basically designed that on his own, implemented that. And on the bottom right is uh, a new sidewalk was constructed through the wedge, disturbing many of the existing gardens. This is what the new garden looks like after that disturbance. So again, this is just alive with blooms. And, and again, now the neighbors have a, a concrete path to uh, actually explore in the wedge. Go ahead, hit the next slide. So one of the reasons that we wanted to do this is not just for the aesthetics, not just to you know, build a space for pollinators. We want this to be something that's going to engage the neighbors on multiple levels. One is people to show up in the wedge, but two, we want to use it as an educational tool. So in conjunction with the wedges, we've also created a, a, an iNaturalist project, and we encourage the neighbors to use iNaturalist to explore life, not only in the wedges, but throughout the neighborhood. So we've got a little map there of Southampton with little markers indicating where people have made observations throughout the neighborhood. So far, and we've been running this project for just a little over two years now, we've got it just over a thousand observations, 48 different uh, uh, observers making these observations throughout the neighborhood. Um, so that's one way we want to engage the neighbors. Another is, is just to, uh, um, is through a newsletter that we published called What's in Bloom slash What is Nature Escaping? And uh, this is an electronic newsletter that we publish a couple times a month. We're not on a regular schedule, mostly through the growing season. We use this and social media on both Facebook and Nextdoor, as, as well as the newsletter itself. We talk about a variety of different topics from the simplest of just what's currently blooming in the wedge and, and what that species is and how you might implement that in your own gardens at, at your own homes. But we also talk about naturescaping, what naturescaping is as a concept and why you'd want to do that. Why do we want to pick natives? Why do we want to pick natives that are appropriate to the different uh, areas within a person's yard? Some people might have a, a large tree in their backyard they want to pick natives that are more woodland habitat biased. If they have no trees at all, then they can go with a more of a prairie setting. So we talk about a lot of those concepts. We talk about pollinators, the decline po pollinators, and one of the most recent newsletter articles, and what we can do as residents to help the pollinators out. Um, so we try to engage people both in education, explaining why we're doing these things, 
as well is, is just get them involved, at, get them to the point where, where they feel like they have uh, ownership in, with these wedges and, and really with the neighborhood as a whole. And um, that, let's go ahead and hit the next slide. And that is really what this is all about. Na we are part of nature. We are nature. We are not separate from nature. This is something that is really just a space for all of us to coexist in. And uh, one thing I want to point out in the, in the bottom right, it's a little difficult to see, but there's that little kind of blue thing on, on, the, on the red paper. There's a woman in the neighborhood, Carrie Stewart. She's known as the Painted Rock Lady. And she paints these rocks and she places them in various places throughout the neighborhood. So it's become kind of a thing to look for these rocks. I've asked Carrie to paint rocks with the names of plants and we're gonna place those within the garden. She hasn't done that yet. That's still in the planning stage. But uh, I've noticed in the last few weeks, these rocks showing up in the wedge. And that little blue rock there has strength written on it. And I mean, there's probably at least a dozen different rocks in the wedge. So I talked to Carrie, I said, well, I, you know, I thank you for, you know, put these rocks in the wedge. I think it's great and because it's become kind of a game for the neighbors to come to the wedge, look for the rocks, explore nature. And uh, Carrie said she's not the one putting these rocks into in the wedge. Her creating the, her, her rocks has triggered other people within the neighborhood to, do the, uh, to paint their own rocks, and they are now putting them in the wedge. So we are just true, I mean, we are trying to engage the people along a, a variety of different domains. So it's not just the nature, it's not just the pollinators, it's a, it's a Mississippi kite. I, found, I saw him circling above the wedge just a couple of weeks ago. It's not just nature, it's not just people, it, it's people just coming and just being and existing and, and, and renewing uh, amongst all this nature. And uh, that's gonna wrap it up for me. Like I said, I just wanted to do a really quick presentation of what we turned that grass lot into. And this is it, this is what it looks like now. Michael Walstetter, thank you so much. It's, I, I would love to see a lot more of this, particularly walking around in it. And I think we'll have some good questions when we get to that part of our naturescaping panel today. Up next, from South Grand Neighborhood Improvement District, wanna call on Rachel Witt and Angie Weber, who have been collaborating to turn what was already a great street in terms of culture and diversity and goods available and history into now a hub of natural diversity and natural greatness too. So Angie and Rachel, I'm gonna mute myself and let you take it away. Well, thank you so much for having us here today. It's a pleasure to be part of this fantastic panel. And it's a passion personally of mine of what South Grand has turned into. And um, it couldn't do without the help of Angie Weber as our Eco Crew um, Program Coordinator. And, uh, but a little history of um, who we are and how this all got started. So uh, next slide. So the South Grand Community Improvement District, we're a political subdivision of the state of Missouri. So we collect revenue from the property owners on their um, assessment rate, that's on their property tax bill. And then uh, a half a cent, um, per, half, per, half a percent. So a penny um, is collected every $2 spent on South Grand. And that's our budget to make improvements on South Grand with public safety, maintenance, building improvements, economic development, and of course the beautification. We have a board of directors that are all volunteers made up of property owners and business owners. Next slide. So back in 2006, um, East West Gateway Council of Governments announced the Great Streets Initiative. And um, there was training sessions on how you can make your street better. And then there was an application process in 2007 that we applied and won. We were the first business district to um, be giving not just planning dollars, but construction dollars. And that's how the Great Streets um, came about. We made wider sidewalks, did a road diet, put in bump outs, put um, rain gardens in, um, and uh, rainscaping with natives, of course, and pervious concrete. So it really helped a lot with the noise volume, with noise pollution and um, air pollution, with changing the way that drivers um, could get down grand. The um, speed limit was decreased, the average mile per hour decreased by 12 miles per hour. It was just amazing to get more foot traffic, more people walking dogs, more families pushing strollers, and also increase more outdoor dining patio areas on South Grand, and just makes people happy when you see beautiful plants growing on South Grand. Um, next slide. 
During the Great Streets Project, um, we also applied for the 319 grant, the Clean Water Act, that was distributed by the um, Department of Natural Resources. It's funded through the EPA. It was a great partnership with the City of St. Louis, East West Gateway, SIUE, the Missouri Department of Conservation, and MSD on really tracking before and after how the rain gardens and the rainscaping really helped with our stormwater management. SIUE collected the data with MSD. Um, that's when I first met Angie Weber when she was with Missouri Department of Conservation. And we put about um, six wonderful rain gardens um, sign signage throughout the district to educate people about what are we doing, what are what's going on here. And it's just a great partnership that we had with this 319 grant. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that um, throughout the presentation. Um, next slide. So as the district evolved with the Great Streets project, we um, added an outdoor event space. It was about a 14 um, space parking lot that we took over and made it a place for placemaking. We have movies, concerts, um, other events with our chalk walk, and just a place for people to gather. Um, and it was, we added native plants. There is some um, sod in there, but we created a green wall that you can see in the one slide there on the bottom left. And those are all natives on that green wall and the natives on the um, bottom right. Um, and it was just a beautiful partnership with adding that. It was all about the timing with the great streets. And I'm so honored to be part of South Grand and creating placemaking and really creating a community. But the wow factor is it's six blocks that we have um, transformed. And because of the vision of the property owners and business owners, and the support from East West Gateway, Council of Governments, and our aldermen and city officials to make this happen. It has become remarkable through the years, and but there's a lot of maintenance and a lot of cost. So we do hire a couple companies to help maintain the native, but to help offset the cost, we started the Eco Crew and hired Angie Weber to really help with that. And she's been doing a terrific job the past two years, and the momentum has carried and this really has bridged that gap with the community and brings people together. And again, I'm so honored to be part of that. So I want to introduce Angie to talk more about the natives on South Grand and the eco crew and what works and doesn't work with natives. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. And to the Earthway Center and the Botanical Gardens for having us um, present um, to everyone today. And um, the next three slides that I'm going to talk about, um, I'm speaking on behalf um, of Pretty City. Uh, they're the current uh, native landscaping contractor. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Cody Hayo, the owner of the company, he's also involved in all the awesome things that are going on with the Southampton Wedge. Um, and they have been working on South Korean since January 2018. And we collectively, um, me and Cody and Rachel, came up with kind of our goals for the landscape and what we want to see um, how we want the landscape to kind of evolve and become um, something that residents and the businesses um, really support and have pride in. Um, and we, we found that the aesthetics in the district is very important. Um, we, we think the appearance of the natives should be more garden-like and a little bit more formal. Um, and that's just to reflect um, just the look of the business um, and, the, and the neighborhood um, as a whole. And by to do that, um, we found that um, you know the line of sight is very important. The vegetation needs to stay shorter. It's important for people to be able to see around the intersections and they're crossing the street and for cars to see if pedestrians are coming. Um, we recognize the value of the stormwater management of all of those features, um, and we want to make sure that we're um, adding all the important native plants and taking care of them so that they're absorbing as much water as possible and preventing it um, to entering the city sewer system. We know that biodiversity is very important. So whenever we um, you know, think about how the landscape areas need to be enhanced, we're keeping in mind um, the number of native species that are out there. We try to increase um, the number of species whenever possible, since those native plants really do a great job of supporting and providing native, native habitat, supporting pollinators. And then our, our eco crew program, that's um, the volunteer events that we have in the district throughout the year, and I'll touch upon that in a minute. Um, we really help support and supplement the work of Cody's crew um, when they're out there in the district doing the maintenance. So it's, it's a very collective um, partnership that we have. You can advance to the next slide. 
Awesome, thank you. So when Pretty City um, started maintaining the landscape um, in 2018, uh, they kind of realized that it had a lifespan. At that point, the native landscape had been installed for about six years. Some of the plants were outcompeting others, so the species composition was different from landscape area to landscape area. Um, specifically, the, the wild bergamot or the monarda uh, was kind of a thug. It was taking over a lot of the other species and the landscape areas. Um, they, they didn't look very um, continuous. They looked like independent landscape areas um, since there wasn't the same type of species throughout all of the landscape areas anymore. And that's kind of a, a typical thing that you see happen with landscapes over time. They do need to be managed to some degree. So Pretty City um, came in and they added more uh, Black-Eyed Susan and Prairie Drop Sheep kind of all throughout the landscape areas to create that consistency. And if you compare the photos um, two years apart, you'll, you'll see there's a lot of color. Um, there's a lot of, there's a little bit of variation, but there is kind of that, that continuity um, and it provides that visual appeal that we were really um, looking for. Um, they also, on a consistent basis, they're trimming any plants that get tall and floppy. That's pretty typical of the Monarda and the New England Aster. They make sure they're getting pruned um, late spring and, and they're doing um, the gardening that's necessary to keep the aesthetics um, you know, looking the way that we want in the district. Advance to the next slide. Thanks, Jane. Um, and one thing that I mentioned that's really important is we want that diversity through the seasons. We want these, um, all the landscape areas and the rain gardens to look amazing um, spring through fall. And so that was something, um, if you, you know, look at all the different areas in the bottom right uh, picture, for example, that's one of the rain gardens and there's iris. Um, those bloom in April. And we have um, throughout the summer, those black eyed Susan or the yellow plant that's pictured, um, they're blooming. Uh, probably June, July through October. And then we also have asters that start blooming late summer into fall. So we wanna make sure that these um, landscape areas and the rain gardens have color all throughout the growing season. But why that's important also is because of that wildlife value. We wanna make sure that we're providing important habitat for pollinators so that they have pollen and nectar, you know, all through um, the spring, summer through the fall. Can we dance to the next slide, please? Awesome, thank you. So this brings me to the South Grant Eco Crew Program. Um, this was started in 2018 as well. Um, and we thought it would be a great way to complement the work of Pretty City um, and the crew that is out there twice a month. Um, and we work together to identify what tasks are best suitable for the contractor and what tasks are best suitable for the volunteers. Um, we've evolved the program to where the Eco Crew really focuses on the parking lot at Hartford Street and also the Ritz Park that Rachel mentioned earlier. Um, it's very easy for our volunteers to have kind of that anchor in those two locations. Um, early on, we, we would move kind of up and down the district, um, and that was a little bit more challenging working along the street. So it's nice that we have what we call now this eco crew corridor, and we have those two locations. That's kind of the, the anchor of where we go out and, and do the work. And we reach out to neighborhood and community organizations uh, we touch base with all of the, the neighborhood uh, groups, uh, Bright Plate St. Louis, for example, the biodiversity initiative through the botanical garden churches and schools, um, master naturals, master gardeners. Uh, we try to involve, um, you know, a variety of different organizations that want to come out and help us. Um, we also have um, eco crew t-shirts that we give out to every volunteer that comes and volunteers with us. Um, you can see some of the volunteers in the photos wearing their t-shirt. Um, and I, once we developed that eco crew name um, and had the t-shirts. Um, I think we really had recognition um, and more ownership of the program, um, especially when we wear the shirts and we're out in the district. There's a lot of people that now can see um, that there's this dedicated group that's out there. And I know Pretty City's the same way when they're wearing their signature um, uniforms. Um, we get a lot of compliments um, and just people thanking us for keeping the district you know, looking nice and they appreciate what we're doing. Uh, this volunteer program has also become um, what I think is very interesting, a way for people to get together and socialize and we network with each other. Um, it's, it's people that are all kind of like-minded and care about the environment, have some interest in gardening. Um, we had family come out um, recently volunteer with us 
And it's just, um, I, I think, a great way to support the district um, and our interests and just um, network with people that care about um, their you know, community. And then we try to have a connection to the local businesses as well. Um, the t-shirts that we purchased were from a local St. Louis vendor, St. Louis Styles. We support the businesses on, on South Grand. We like to feed the volunteers well um, after the event. And so we'll buy them pizza or ice cream uh, from the creamery, for example. Uh, and we, we just kind of, we really want to give back um, to the district and support um, everything that they do there. And then we promote our events on the South Grand website. And we have an e-newsletter e that's sent out uh, maybe once a month or so whenever we have an upcoming event coming up. And then we also have registration online on the South Grand School webpage so people can come um, and volunteer for our event. Moving to the next slide. Awesome, thank you. And this just shows our eco food schedule. We have events all throughout the year. Um, they kind of focus on the types of work that we have um, in any given season. Um, at the beginning of the year, we have um, a few days where we have volunteers come out. We cut back um, the vegetation as needed, and then that's spanning all throughout the winter. And then we'll go back in and we'll do a big mulching event. And then throughout the uh, late spring, um, summer, and into early fall, that involves a lot of weeding and litter pickup. Not that there's a lot of that to do um, per se, but if we do it on an ongoing basis, it keeps the district looking really nice um, and it really complements um, what Pretty City is doing when they come out and um, do the work kind of all along um, the intersections and the street. And then, um, yeah, and then we occasionally have some events that come up here and there. Um, if we have a school or other group that wants to do work on South Korean, we'll fit that in as well. Um, if there's any planting projects, that'll happen in the spring and fall. So the schedule might change a little bit um, from year to year based on the work that we have to do. And the next slide, Jean. Jean. Next slide. Is it stuck? Awesome. Thank you. And um, this is just a snapshot of our accomplishments. Um, and I think the numbers kind of speak for themselves. I think it's amazing how the program has grown from 2018 to 2019, um, something that I don't know we even um, anticipated. And I think that just speaks to the momentum, um, the, the name and the t-shirts um, and, and kind of how we, um, I guess, just developed that ownership um, and that we now have a core group of volunteers. That really evolved from the end of 2018 going into 2019, um, but we now have, have had about twice as many events um, that we hold now is our first year. Um, just the number of unique volunteers that has come out and helped us has grown um, over the last uh, two years or so. Um, and then just the number of hours that they contributed. Um, we have a very dedicated group of 10 to 12 um, or 14 or so volunteers that consistently come out event after event after event. Um, and that group includes residents, it includes master naturalists and master gardeners, um, and, you know, we have new people that join us from time to time in schools and different groups. And it's just a, it's a really great mix of people and interests and backgrounds. Um, and I really think it speaks to um, just the character of the South Korean neighborhood and all the different partners involved. And I'm just, as Rachel mentioned, I'm pleased to be a part of it. And I'm proud of all the work that we've accomplished to date. Thank you. So thank you very much, Rachel Witt and Angie Weber from South Grand. I love that tagline, the best the world has to offer, all in just six blocks. Another shout out to South Grand. It is a green dining district through our St. Louis Green Dining Alliance. And as people start returning to sidewalk cafes in lovely weather and continue to support our restaurants, when you want to go to one that is certified green, South Grand is one of the places to definitely check out amid those blooms. <coughs> Excuse me, Yvonne Steingruby, I'm going to ask you to unmute and come up and tell us about how uh, Webster Groves Parks are creating a homegrown national park in your system of parks. I think you're going to be sponsoring, uh, spotlighting one of the parks specifically in this short presentation today. But um, Yvonne, come on up and take, this, take the mic. Okay. So thanks for having me, Jean. I feel like we're, that I'm in the company of giants in the industry and I feel honored to be in this panel. Um, I hope that Webster Groves is doing their part 
and uh, helping with the movement of the national, the homegrown national park movement. Uh, the topics I'll talk about briefly will be about the parks division, our volunteer corps, um, our strategic partnerships, and then we'll focus in on Lockwood Park. And then we also have something that we call our, um, there are pet peeves, we call mulchscapes and workscapes. And um, sort of how we are approaching these different areas in the city right of ways to, um, to advance pollinator habitat and also get rid of some of these areas that are constant uh, workscapes. So um, next slide. So the park staff, one superintendent, that's me. I have two park supervisors. One is a maintenance supervisor and one is a horticulture supervisor. Uh, we have five full-time workers and we have approximately five seasonals. Um, so the majority of our work is spent on typical park related problems and projects such as um, lawn care, trash removal, cleaning the bathrooms, making sure the pavilions are ready for the patrons. And so when we get to spend time on uh, ecological restoration or planting trees and that sort of thing, it's sort of the best part of our job in our opinion. So um, when, whenever we have time, we try to work in those projects. And the reason why we can be successful is because of our partnerships and our volunteers. Otherwise we just really wouldn't have the time. So some of our strategic partnerships include relationships with Great Rivers Greenway. Um, I kind of have them all listed there, the Botanical Gardens, MSD, Shaw Nature Reserve, Forest Relief of Missouri, MDC, and BioMSTL. And um, those are folks that will jump in and help advertise some of our volunteer events. They also supply gloves. Um, snacks. I know volunteers like snacks and we got to have them ready for them. Um, and they also supply tools and manpower to help us with some of these restoration projects. Um, the uh, uh, great, or, sorry, um, green, I can't see my slide. Uh, Deer Creek Watershed Alliance um, has helped sponsor our volunteer program and they created a website for us where folks can go in and sign up for Webster Grows Greenkeepers. And um, as of yesterday, we have over 174 members. And um, so basically we set up work events where folks can come in and work as groups. There's corporate groups that will come in, individual projects, or people can adopt a garden somewhere. They can also work with our staff and then that way they're able to learn some things while they're out in the field. And um, that's been very successful. The picture that shows that big group of volunteers, that was a project where we had the Air Force came in. We had 40 folks from the, from the Air Force come in and they removed honeysuckle, one of our parks, and they basically eradicated it in that park. So that was a huge success. And by partnering with these folks on the right that you see listed, they have access to a lot of these groups that are looking for projects to do. And, and I never turn down work, so you're always welcome to call me. And that's sort of how I play it. And, and we'll, we'll make the project happen if you bring us the volunteers. So next slide, please. So we also, with Webster Grows, we have a commission called the Green Space Advisory Commission. And they are made up of a group of volunteers and they're also citizens of Webster Groves. And um, they're responsible for advising us on how we can improve our green spaces in the city. And um, they're very active. They're not afraid to get out there and help us plant. They've pulled plenty of honeysuckle. They also have created a speaker series where they'll bring in experts to talk about pollinators. Um, and then they also usually put a pretty good float in our parade that has some type of theme to do with trees or pollinators. Next slide, please. So the part that we're gonna talk about, it was, it was very hard to condense this talk down to only one park because I feel like we have at least five to 10 areas that we are currently working on and restoring and trying to become part of this homegrown national park. 
And we also want to try to be an example to citizens since we are high visibility. When we plant something, it gets a lot of views and people want to know what that plant is and why we're planting it. And so we feel we take that on as a responsibility that we make sure that we're doing the right thing out there. So focusing in on Lockwood Park, this park is about three and a quarter acres. Um, it has a one acre prairie. It also has a short leaf pine tree grove and it has a butterfly garden. So back in 2012, and the picture in the upper left, that's sort of what the park looked like. It was a small playground and mostly turf. And then the picture to the right is the, the park under renovation. And they did put in a nice playground, but the bottom picture shows what that park looks like now. And if you look way back in the background, you can see a tiny little playground with a lot of plants. And um, so that to me is a success story. I've had people call and talk about all of the different pollinators that they've seen in the park. And um, it's also helped tremendously with the, a lot of the stormwater problems that we were having in the area. So next slide, please. So a little bit more about that park and some partnerships. So we received a $10,000 cost share grant from the Missouri Department of Conservation. And we worked in partnership with the college school students who came out and helped us plant that garden. And then they also, we will actually meet Angie Weber out at Shaw Nature Reserve and she works with the students and they collect seed in the fall at the Nature Reserve. And then that is mixed by volunteers and staff and then the kids come back out and they help us seed that prairie. Next slide, please. And so from a managerial standpoint, we're always looking at ways to save the citizens tax dollars. And um, by getting rid of a lot of that turf, we've gotten rid of pollution, uh, fossil fuel usage. We've reduced the mowing from two hours a week down to about 30 minutes per week. Um, and that saves man hours. And not to mention the beautification aspect of it and, and how many pollinators that we've actually brought into that park. Next slide, please. So um, onto what we call, there are pet peeve projects. So if you look around town, um, there's areas that we would spend copious amounts of times weeding, spraying chemicals, and sort of fighting this losing battle um, to make the plants look good and to keep the weeds at bay. And so we're looking at these areas and we're engaging staff in the process and we're naming these areas workscapes. So they're, they're areas with low return on investment. So if you're spending eight hours a day weeding an area and it still doesn't look that good, it's time to reevaluate what's going on there. So this is an area down at Element 44. It's right along the westbound entrance ramp. This was an area that had Itea virginica, which is a good plant, but it just can't handle the salt and the, uh, the salt spray from the roads and just the exhaust. Um, and so we reevaluated that area. We took out all the ITEA and we put in tollway sedge. And then the second tier, we moved some daylilies onto the second tier and then we have oak leaf hydrangeas. So we're, we're basically filling the space. And we've, few years and the only maintenance for the tollway sedge is to actually just mow it down once or twice a year. It's been a real winner for us. So next slide please. Next slide please Jean. Great thanks. So along with that we have a another term we use it's called a mulch scape. Um, it's sort of in the industry now where I think in people's mind, we've been using mulch for so many years now that people think that that is landscaping and it, it's not. We want to see plants. We want to see seasonal color. And when I see mulch now, I think that ne that space needs to be covered with plants. So what we're doing is we're getting rid of the mulch scapes. We're filling in the real estate. We, we want to see plants from one edge of the garden to the other. And those plants are working. They're doing environmental services for us. They're helping out the pollinators. And the difference between a mulch scape and a 
plantscape where you see plants, it's, there's no contest. So if you look around town and Webster goes, it's sort of what we're up to. We're trying to install all the layers of the forest. We want to put in not only the trees and shrubs, but we want that ground cover there as well. And, and so that's sort of what we're up to. And from a managerial standpoint and a cost saving standpoint, we would normally spend about $30,000 a year on our mulching operations. And we would bring in two semis a week for at least five weeks and do nothing but five people blowing mulch in. And we don't do that anymore. We haven't done it for at least three years. So um, I did the numbers and it's about a $30,000 a year savings. And we don't have people hurt their backs. We don't have people tripping over the hose. Um, it's a nasty, dirty job. And quite frankly, mulch, once you have too much mulch on, it's actually very counteractive for helping the plants out. So we've sort of changed our mind about mulch. We use our own wood chips in house. And so that's sort of a win-win. And, um, and we're able to save the citizens money and use some of that money to buy plants and green mulches. So um, secrets to our success, I think rely heavily on engaging employees in the process. Um, at the beginning, it was sort of a hard sell because I work with a lot of folks who probably had the same training I did 20 or 30 years ago, where you want to plant gardens that are very separate and not a community type planting. And we're sort of merging away from that. There's still in the city, people still want to see some form and structure, but we're also trying to put in communities of plants. And um, what helps us too is I have students from um, the community college that are already getting this training. So they, it's, it's an easy buy-in for them. They already kind of know where we're headed. So those are secrets to our success. Um, and last slide, please. So we, we truly are committed in Webster Groves in the Parks Division. We believe every day we need to give the citizens their money's worth. Our goals would be to eradicate all the honeysuckle invasives in the parks. Uh, we're working hard on creating a vegetative buffer along our creeks and streams. If we can get up to 100 feet in some areas, that's sort of the, the creme de la creme of where we want to be. Um, we want to create stable habitats and refuge for wildlife. Uh, we've gotten our chemical usage down by about 90%. And how we're doing that is we're actually using burn torches on some of our hardscape areas to burn weeds instead of spraying them with Roundup and then we're out planting the weeds. Um, and then we, we've done a couple stream team cleanups and we're working hard along our creeks and streams and we wanna be a model for healthy streams as well. So we think that uh, with our intentionality, our help with our partnerships and dedication that, that eventually we'll be successful and, um, and hopefully a model for people to go and, and see how it really could be in the park system. And that's my story. Yvonne Steingruby, thank you so much. Superintendent of Parks in Webster Groves. So we have some time for questions here. Hopefully we will um, have some ready for us in q and I'm going to bring that up. Um, I do have a couple questions I want to seed into the conversation here with our, um, our gallery view, all of our speakers. So if everyone will unmute. Um, Diversity of plants. One of the things I saw in this, in all of your projects, were a limited palette of plants, not 87,000 kinds of plants. And when I think of plant diversity, one of the things I normally think of is like, let's use as many kind of plants as possible. But that's, you know, why were we not seeing that? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, one of the reasons that we have a limited palette of plants is the vast majority of our plants are through the Nature's Naturescaping, uh, Neighbors Naturescaping Grant Program, and they've got a defined list of plants, so we are limited to, to that list. So that, that slows us down just a little bit as far as trying to create a wider diversity. We do have a small budget to buy plants that aren't on their list, but uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, the, to increase the diversity would be great. The other side of that, and this is more from a design perspective, um, Southampton's kind of a, a scrubby Dutch neighborhood. So there's still quite a few folks who, who like order and structure. 
So we do have several different wedges, and one of the wedges um, is a little bit more wild looking, and it actually does have a little bit more diversity. It has some more un unusual plants in it. And um, Marie's wedge, we decided to stay uh, a little bit more ordered, a little more structured. If you'll notice, the plants are even kind of grouped or massed a little bit. So there's going to be a learning curve with uh, some of the people in our neighborhood, and that is, you know, first they want to see something structured. We do it with natives. Once we've done that with natives, then we can bring them to the next step. Well, it should be a little bit wild because the pollinators like that. So it, it's just a process. Anyone else want to comment on that, on limiting your plant palette? Um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Angie. <laughs> I was just going to say from the South Grand perspective, it's easier for maintenance if you have a smaller, simpler planting palette. Um, especially if you have volunteers or people that are caring for the landscape that don't have extensive knowledge of what those species are. Um, and I, when I have it, um, conversations with different um, homeowners or community groups or volunteers that I'm working with, it doesn't even matter what the weed is. I know sometimes people kind of, they want to know what the weed is and make sure that, you know, they know how to look for it. And I just kind of um, have the approach like these are the plants that we like and that are good and if anything looks different than, than this cluster of plants around it, it needs to be pulled out. So if you plant like things together and you see a cluster of purple flowers and you see something that's a white flower next to it or that, that the leaf texture is different or it's a vine, they know immediately to pull it out. So it's kind of easy recognition um, for the, the different groups that might be caring for that space. Um, and it's just um, easier for maintenance. And then that plant can also fill the space quicker if you choose species that are um, just a little bit more aggressive um, and kind of can hold their ground and compete with the other species that are around. Yvonne, I think you showed that really well in this slide about the entrance to Highway 44 when you replaced, you know, you just used three kinds of plants. You had prairie drop seed and you had the, I forget what the middle one was, and then the oak leaf hydrangea. Question about aesthetics. You know, South Grand, this is a busy city street. It's a very diverse neighborhood. Um, scrubby Dutch neighborhood, you mentioned, Michael, and a, a suburban community, Webster Groves. How, what are some keys to getting people to fall in love with this kind of landscaping versus boxwoods, petunias, and turf? Your top key or two, each one of you, please. I think education's a big part of it, and folks like you coming out and talking to the citizens about why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and then I would say as long as the plants are available to the public, that's a big part of it too. Um, and I think to some de degree you have to have some order in some of the areas. It, it makes people feel a little bit more comfortable if they see some order. Um, and some of these more traditional gardens, but I do think you need to have some of the wild spaces. And I would say that in general, my feedback from the citizens of Webster, I would say most of the feedback I get is very positive, but once in a while you'll have someone who, who does think that these plants look kind of rangy in some areas. So you sort of have to pick the spots for it. And you talked to Angie and Rachel about keeping certain things trimmed down and knowing when to do that in the seasons. What were you going to say, Rachel? Um, being a major corridor of Grand Boulevard, um, we have a lot of traffic, about 28,000 cars a day, and we need to make sure what line of sight when people are turning off of Grand or onto Grand with the natives. And that's something we learned through the years with the streetscape um, that we put in. And that's why we're limiting what type of natives are on South Grand because we can't have them grow over a certain height because then it just affects with walkability safety for pedestrians and for drivers. We wanna make sure no one is injured because of our native selection that we have on Grand. Mm -hmm. how, how about you, Michael? How about the, the, the change of taste, the change of aesthetics and influencing that in your neighborhood? Um, I, I guess there's a couple different keys. Uh, making sure that it's ordered, just to kind of comment on, on what Yvonne mentioned. So uh, when we do plant, we put the shorter plants on the edges. So to give it just kind of that, that angled or, or wedge shape, um, vertical wedge shape, that gives people the idea that it's intentional rather than just something that, that's let go. Uh, the other thing is um, 
pollinators. Uh, people are really kind of keyed into pollinators and the bee population. So we say that, you know, what we're doing helps the pollinators. So that's something they can get invested in. Um, so I, I think th those two things are probably the biggest key. Um, a third thing that we just started doing this year and, and, and uh, we started giving plants away. So <laughs> um, some, some of the plants have done really well. So I, I know Angie mentioned as far as the Menarda uh, in, along South Grand, we've, we've got a couple, column, our columbine just exploded in one of the wedges and it started popping up in places we didn't really want it. We didn't want a monoculture of columbine. So I started digging it up, potting it, and then as part of our What's in Bloom newsletter, we'd say, these plants are available. So um, that's another way to get people to say, hey, you know, there's something kind of cool about these spaces. And then I, I guess finally is just make it inviting so people can go and sit in them and, and recognize that these are actually just kind of a, a, a nice uh, cognitively restoing, uh, renewing space to, to be in. Mm -hmm. We have a couple questions about specific resources. For example, the list of books you had on your, on your one slide, Yvonne, and green resources at mobot.org, green resources at mobot.org. We can send you that information by email after this presentation or also answer any questions that were not answered. So resources, we have a couple questions about how do I learn how to do this? How do I get you know get to learn about the plants so i can do this in my own yard what are the best resources for people picking up on the kinds of things that you're doing that you all would recommend Dwayne webster grows green keepers <laughs> come out and work with us <laughs> um, a big inspiration for me and i learn all the time is go out in nature and in true areas that have been undisturbed and look and see what nature does on its own and I think that that will give a lot of inspiration on how you can um, grow that same type of plant community in your own yard. You kind of need to study nature itself. Um, to comment too on, on that volunteer aspect, um, one of our volunteers who's become um, really kind of involved with the project uh, has gone on to start implementing a lot of this on his own. He didn't know that much um, when he initially initially started volunteering with us, but his goal was to learn more. So now his house is on, on the sustainable backyard tour, things like that, he's got chickens. Mm -hmm. He's really kind of gone the, the full route. And uh, another neighbor who, um, he lives right across Wherry, he's decided that he now wants his yard to be an extension of the wedge. So he's gonna convert all his turf grass, everything into just this natural habitat. But these are people who come out and actually interact with us when we're volunteering doing work within the wedge. Another resource I want to mention is Grow Native. So one of the things that Grow Native has is these pre-designed garden landscapes. So uh, they can get you started, kind of get you past that hurdle of how can I really initiate this? You know, I've got just shade in my backyard, what plants are right for that? I've got, I got full sun. Grow Native has designs specifically addressed to those type of habitats. So I, I think that would be a great place to get started. Mm -hmm. How about South Grand folks, your recommendation for resources? The two that come to mind are Wild One. Um, that's a grassroots organization. I believe it's national, but we have a local chapter, native plant enthusiasts. Um, the majority, I think the members are homeowners um, and also professionals that care about native plants. Um, they have native gardens, um, you know, in their yards and they have meetings. I don't know exactly how they've translated into a platform um, now with the COVID situation, but in the past, they would do their monthly meetings at different um, homes of people that have native gardens. And so they really share from each other. Um, you know, and it's just a, a, a great group of, of people that have varying levels of expertise. And they do plant swaps, I think, throughout the year, just kind of a great uh, go-to resource. And then also Shaw Nature Reserve um, does Native Plant School. Um, that also was something that um, in the past, there would be monthly um, presentations out in the garden at Shaw Nature Reserve about a variety of topics related to native landscaping. I think now some of that might be a virtual format, um, but that's also a great go-to resource. And they have four chapters of a native landscaping manual online, one of which um, focuses on rain gardens and uh, like the formal um, aspect of gardening with native plants. So those are two uh, great go-to resources. We're, we're really close to the end of our time here. I have a couple other questions I want to get in, and I want to put in a plug for the books of Doug Talamy, Bringing Nature Home, 
and Nature's Best Hope, and give a listen to the conversation with Doug Tallamy, part of our Green Living Festival, uh, uh, things you can listen to online about what we are doing that is really good here in St. Louis, like national leadership level stuff. Rachel Witt, you are the head of a business district, and we have some folks in a business audience joining us here today. What are some of the advantages economically in terms of the viability of your network, your neighborhood that biodiversity adds in? Well, ever since we received the Great Streets Initiative and maintaining it through the years, our sales tax revenue has increased. Um, every year there's an uptick in our revenue and um, this foot traffic that we have on South Grand. So since the beginning um, of the, since the completion of the Great Streets Initiative and where we are today, there's been like 30, 35% increase in sales tax revenue on South Grand. So by showing an area that's attractive and people want to be, they want to be a part of and increase walkability. And so when people are driving down Grand, they realize I'm entering a business district. There's something more here than just sterile concrete sidewalks and light poles. They see something they see is attractive. People grab an ice cream, they walk the district, they sit at one of the benches, they go to the pocket park. I mean, we, it's all about placemaking and being a part of the community and by improving the beautification of an area, it attracts people. They see beautiful colored plants, they wanna be part of that. So in turn, it helps the businesses um, by being such a, um, I hate to say it, we are a demonstration streetscape in the region. There's very few streetscapes that you see um, at the scale like ours in the region. And I just hope we can be a steward to see more um, business districts take this lead and by being a community improvement district, to be honest, the only way that we were able to implement this and maintain it and in um, the leadership that we have from our board and from the community to really embrace it. Last quick question. Not everybody's comfortable in nature. People are creeped out by bugs. People feel like maybe they're not so welcome in those places. What is your number one thing to say, folks, about how to invite more people to be comfortable in nature from your experience. Have to be very brief here, we're almost out of time, but I think that's an important point to close on. Just volunteer, be part of your community, join an eco crew like a South Grand, and find out more information in your own neighborhood if there's a group of a beautification committee. It's just learning about it changes your perspective and it just helps you grow as an individual. Thank you, Rachel Witt, she's executive director of the South Grand Community Improvement District. Next guest. Yes, I, I agree with Rachel. I think it's good to maybe just ask someone to give you a tour of their garden. Um, because once you start to learn names and sort of learn some of the values of these plants, I think you can't help but fall in love with them. And you don't have to do that in Latin. You can do it in English with common names like rattlesnake master and royal catchfly. Thanks, Yvonne Steingruby. She's park superintendent for Webster Groves, city of Webster Groves. Angie Weber, how about you? I'm going to touch upon what both Yvonne and Rachel said, and just education I think is key. I, if people understand the functionality of that landscape um, and how important it is to the pollinators and how um, it's adapted to the climate and, the, and what little resources that these native plants use, I think you can't help but love it. And I also um, compare it to a prairie and a woodland and how at peace people feel when they walk among nature and why would you not want that in your own community or your backyard. And so I just think that outreach and education is an important part of it. Angie Weber coordinates the Eco Crew on South Grand and has been a tremendous contributor, continues to be, from many different points of partnership. Thank you, Angie. Michael Walshtetter, you get the last word. How to, how to introduce more people to be comfortable in nature from your Southampton neighborhood experience. So education is key, like, like everyone else said. Um, the, the, the flowers, I, I tried to take a really attractive close in pictures of the flowers, they kind of draw people in. But the other thing I, I, I tell people, and this doesn't work with mosquitoes, is I tell them that, you know, compared to a lot of the critters are out there, we're big and scary. So it's actually us that are the scary people out there, the scary things out there. So just to keep that in mind, is that nothing out there is really going to hurt you if you don't bug it. We're all coexisting. And Michael, you set the tone at the very beginning of this, saying that we are part of nature, nature is part of us. Naturescaping, the theme of this third of three days of the Green Living Festival from the Earthway Center of the Missouri Botanical Garden. I'm Jean Ponzi. Thank you so much for joining us for this live panel. 
check out our other resources. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to Ameren, Missouri, presenting sponsor of the Green Living Festival.